Well, hi there. A uh, drastic change in scenery. Um, no, this is not my bedroom. As a matter of fact, I'm out on business travel for the next few days. So for a little while anyway, I'll be recording from this uh, dark, dank, and uh, uh, dingy motel room on the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah. I'm going to be starting a new book. And I've decided to work on this one for YouTube. The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And I've decided it for a couple of reasons. One, or the main one actually, is that I've already read about half of this book. And I need to finish it. I need to discipline myself to finish what I've started. These YouTube videos are helping. Uh, another reason actually is that uh, I am recording this entire book since it is open source. I am uh, recording this entire book for LibriVox.org, which is an online resource for uh, audiobooks that you can download for free. And if you want to listen to me drone on and on, I'll provide a link on the side. I think I've got a couple of lectures done, and hopefully I'll be finished uh, before too long. Well, what is this book? It was published, I believe, or at least it was given in 1902. This is a series of 20 lectures given by William James, who was a well-known psychologist at the time. And these were given in 1902, and this was back in the days when public lectures were a form of entertainment, right? This is before television, radio, things like that, internet, obviously. So people went out to hear uh, well-known experts on a variety of topics speak and debate. And William James wanted to approach the study of religion in a way that was different uh, than what was being done at that time. There were several things that were being done at that time uh, with the advent of psychoanalysis and the, the, um, the, the rise of psychology, which is William James's field. He wanted to approach it as a human phenomenon. He did not really want to approach it um, philosophically. Uh, he found uh, the proofs of God, such as uh, the you know the ontological proof, the teleological proof, the transcendental proof, all these proofs of God that we hear about in philosophy. Um, he didn't find much helpfulness in those, and. I have to agree with them. They, they proofs like that are just so become so abstract sometimes that they frankly bore me stiff. If there is a God out there and we want to study who that God is, it shouldn't be that difficult. It shouldn't be that that abstract. It shouldn't. You, you shouldn't have to be a PhD in logic to figure this stuff out. Um, I, I agree absolutely with James on that one, but he also um, thought that studying the origins of religions while helpful was not helpful for understanding the spiritual component of religions. Um, the, uh, the history of religion school was, uh, was prominent back in those days. We're talking about like uh, James Frazier and Rudolf Otto, uh, folks like that, who tried to decipher the origin of religious experience. Uh, James also was not too interested in that. He wanted to catalog as well as he could, and I believe he spent 20 years uh, cataloging the, the actual religious adherents, uh, what their religion meant to them, and describing their experiences. And I like how he puts it. Um, this is a new kind of religious inquiry, uh, as he calls it. So, many of the lectures that he goes over are on the religion of the healthy-minded, that is, the, uh, the religion where everything is positive, the sick soul, or one that is repentant uh, by his religion, uh, the religious experience of conversion, uh, mysticism, the value of saintliness, things like that. He's got 20 lectures in all, and I guess I'll be reading about all that stuff. The first lecture is basically an introduction, and it's called Religion and Neurology. And it discusses William James's general approach, how he's going to approach this topic of, of analyzing religion. 
and he has my my general view when I read a previous book, The uh, Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. When I read the writings of these medieval mystics, it seemed too easy to me to look at them as as mentally ill or mentally psychotic or or ill in any way, troubled physically or mentally. I wanted to understand the mystic on their own terms, taking for granted that something mystical was actually happening in their lives. Um, it just seemed to be more honest as to the, uh, the intent of their writings rather than try to psychoanalyze them. William James agrees. He calls, um, he calls that, uh, let's see what I got here. Medical materialism, he calls such analysis medical materialism. When you look back at the religious adherent and just uh, say that they're, they're having a mental disorder of one kind or another. Uh, he writes that about St. Paul. Many people think that St. Paul had, or had epilepsy. Um, uh, George Fox, who was the founder of, of Quakers, of the Quaker movement, I read about him in, in uh, Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. Um, William James has a large chunk of writings from George Fox. Clearly, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he was a troubled man mentally. But James doesn't want to go there. He doesn't want to discover the origin of their thought as a process of firing neurons. He doesn't want to go there. He says, after all, even with the atheist who has the naturalistic point of view, if you want to psychoanalyze them, you have to do the same process. Um, he writes, uh, quoting H. Maudsley, What right have we to believe nature under any obligation to do her work by means of complete minds only? That is a, a mind in the natural sense rather than the spiritual sense. She may find an incomplete mind a more suitable instrument for a particular purpose. It is the work that is done and the quality in the worker by which it was done that is alone of moment. And it may be no great matter from a cosmical standpoint, if in other qualities of character he was singularly defective, if indeed he were hypocrite, adulterer, eccentric, or lunatic. In other words, if we're going to study the religious experience, we can't assume that spirit... How should I say this? We can't assume that the religious experience, or we can't assume that thought process only resides in a natural mind. To the religious person, mystical religious experience is just as valid, and we want to meet that person on their terms, whether we believe in it or not. And I don't believe James did. He approached this solely as, a, as an outsider, as objective as he could. But we have to meet them on their terms and not try to psychoanalyze them. If we're going to study the psychology of religion, if we want to study the experience of religious adherence, we have to study them as if what they believed were actually true. Uh, after all, if you're a naturally minded person who relies on natural processes uh, for his, uh, for his thought, pro uh, thought patterns, for his epistemology, and uh, does not assume anything religious, we, and we want to psychoanalyze that person, we still go back to the firing of, of, of neurons in either case. So James says we can't assume that one is more probable than the other when we're studying the subject. We have to meet them on their terms. So that's where we're going to start. That's the starting off point that he, those are the starting conditions, kind of his starting line, his methodology that he's going to use. And in the next 19 lectures, William James has quotes from a variety of sources, from mystical writings, from his fellow uh, psychologists, uh, from their writings, things like that. He's going to study different aspects of the religious believer. Um, okay, I guess that's it. Take care.